Hi, everyone. I am excited to be here today with you. My name is Tamara McCord, and some of you may remember I was with you in Las Vegas a couple of years ago. I am a licensed mental health counselor located in Indianapolis, Indiana. In preparation for today, I had the privilege of speaking with four members of the Ataxia community. I am honored to get to share their stories, insights, and encouragement with you. In discussing the psychological aspects of ataxia, we're going to go over three key points. Understanding grief, emotional self-awareness, and how resiliency is for everyone. Back in 2002, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And shortly after his diagnosis, he passed away. Of course, what we would all agree is that what I experienced when he died was grief. What I didn't understand or grasp at that time was that his diagnosis of cancer alone created loss. The diagnosis interrupted my family's world and its course. How much energy and how alert my dad could be created another loss in my life. Seeing my dad's decrease in ability to do certain things created yet another grief and loss. There were consistent losses one after the other. Experiencing these losses were physically and emotionally exhausting for me and my family. And this same process of loss applies to ataxia as well. It's exhausting to wonder, is this a permanent or temporary loss? Today I feel somewhat decent, but what about tomorrow? The stress of not knowing what will happen, what loss will be experienced next, can be overwhelming. It can often give us the feeling of being out of control, of which very few people can tolerate for long periods of time. This is true whether you've been personally diagnosed or whether you are a caregiver. As I mentioned, I was able to speak with members of the ataxia community and ask them questions about their emotional and mental experiences of ataxia. Frank Orlovsky said some of the adjectives that best describe the mental and emotional realities include aggravating, infuriating, and disturbing. Stephanie Leonard admitted in the beginning of her twins diagnosis, she was in denial. She set out to find a cure that somehow she'd be able to do what the good doctors weren't able to do. Jason Hubbard shares that he feels frustration, helplessness, and guilt dealing with the disease. His wife, Sherry, feels stress, constant grief, scared, hurt, mad, sad, and angry. I share all this with you to validate and normalize what some of you are currently feeling or what some of you have previously experienced. This is grief. It's a complicated and heavy process. We slowly move through the process and sometimes we go backwards through it. There are days we're emotionally doing great and we've come to accept our circumstances and with no notice and generally without our permission, we can slide back into wishing our situation was different. Pauline Boss, a psychotherapist, speaks of freezing in grief and gives the warning that if couples or individuals or family members fail to tolerate the uncertainty and the unknown that comes with grief, 
they will be less able to make the decisions necessary for everyday living. Freezing and grief can happen due to the nature of the fact that these losses are not a one-time event. We're experiencing a gradual drip, drip, drip of losses, which are traumatic to experience. To prevent freezing in this grief process, it's best to avoid living in absolutes and embrace the uncertainty. It's about accepting the situation we find ourselves in, not trying to change it, but rather changing what we hope for. At this point, we're allowing grief to make us new. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Embracing and acknowledging the negative feelings that arise about our situations and giving honor to the losses when this happens, we're able to make new discoveries about ourselves and our loved ones. Frank said, in addition to the aggravation, infuriation, and disturbing feelings, that ataxia also resulted in determination, realization, acceptance, and abilities and strengths previously unknown to him. Stephanie shared that once she realized she was not going to find a cure, she got depressed. She then realized she had to let it go and released it. It was at this point she found her passion, which launched into a new career of doing hair and makeup. Stephanie exclaimed, I would have never found my passion if it wasn't for the pain. Jason shared, he also felt more aware, thankful, satisfied, and grateful. Sherry professed that growth is a byproduct of ataxia. This is the other side of it. Our feelings will not remain at the level of intensity that they initially started out at. It will be heavy at times, but not all the time. Experience the grief and allow it to form us and use us. So how exactly do we get to the other side? It helps to acknowledge all the emotions we experience which involves being emotionally self-aware. Now, self-awareness doesn't happen without our intention. We are active participants in this process. We're becoming more conscious of things that for some of us may have previously been more subconscious. When we're aware of what's going on internally, then we know whether to keep on the same path or whether to change paths. When we ignore or avoid grief, unfortunately, good emotions can get lumped in there too. This is an important point. If we deny ourselves to feel the sorrow of the experience, we're also denying the ability to receive comfort in the experience. If we cut ourselves off from sorrow, we lose the chance to learn and love well. Asking for and receiving help can be a part of this learning and loving. Jason shared it was hard at first for him to accept help due to his insecurities, but it became easier as he saw the stress it caused others when he didn't ask for help. Frank noted that it's always, he's always been an independent person and has taken time to ask for help. He's learned what he is and is not capable of doing. Stephanie carried the weight of the world on her shoulders. And over time, she realized she could not do it alone. She was afraid of being a burden to others but through the process, she learned that others 
are there for her. These are beautiful examples of how love and learning can meet us in the midst of grief and sorrow. Now, some of us do the opposite of ignoring the negative. Some of us can get stuck in the negative. Our internal dialogue will greatly influence what emotions we feel and the decisions we make. It will also affect how our body feels. Almost every person I interviewed was able to identify a place in their body where they could make the connection between the emotions they were experiencing and how it was manifesting in their body. They shared experiencing headaches, issues with their skin, an upset stomach, or a foggy brain. Sherry shared, there are days when she feels stuck and almost paralyzed in the grief and pain. I bet she's not alone. She notes that she sometimes beats herself up and it takes a day to a day and a half to get unstuck. Staying attuned to our body can help us understand ourselves emotionally because sometimes it's a symptom in our body that's the first cue that we're experiencing an emotion. Once we're aware of this, here's where the empowerment piece kicks in. We can begin concentrating on our thoughts. Our mind and our thoughts, man, that's the control center that can influence everything else. When we pay more attention to our internal dialogue and the cues in our body, we'll be better able to experience any grief that is present and appropriately express it. Frank and Stephanie use journaling as a way to experience and express their emotions in a healthy way. Frank added, that a good verbal release at the world helps alleviate anger. <laughs> I like that. Jason opens up to his wife. Sherry noted after a day or so of feeling stuck in her emotions, she gives herself grace, which helps her feel unstuck. Here are some questions to help increase self-awareness. If we can ask ourselves, what thoughts do I have about the details or events of this day? What made me smile today? And where do I feel this in my body? What sparked sadness today? Then where is that located in my physical sensations? What brought laughter today? And when did I feel closest to my higher power today? Or when did I feel most distant? And lastly, what am I looking forward to? When we're reviewing our daily thoughts, we can also ask ourselves, are these thoughts helpful? And if we see that they're not helpful, then we can decide who do we feel more comfortable discussing this with. Increasing this awareness, even while feeling vulnerable, will help increase a sense of self-worth, stronger relationships, a sense of strength and appreciation for life. It will also help us feel, allow others to comfort us and in the grief and sorrow that we're experiencing. Everyone I interviewed unanimously agrees that ataxia changes a person. Becoming more self-aware will also help us understand that there is a determination inside of us to help keep us going amidst the pain. This is what many people refer to as resilience. Psychologists define resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, 
tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And at times, it may include deep personal growth. Here's the beautiful part about resilience. It's not a personality trait that only some people carry. Anyone can learn and acquire resilience. Studies have shown that resilience is not for the extraordinary. It's actually ordinary. Resilience applies to everyone. No one is left out. Once we experience grief and gain more awareness, we can begin to allow that resilience to help us make meaning out of our circumstances. Now, meaning for you may not look like finding a new career, although if so, great. Perhaps it looks more like finding joy in a moment with a loved one or deciding this week you'll focus more on kindness and next week will be more about patience. Jason can find meaning in the simple pleasures, which helps him cope and find joy. He loves sitting in his nice leather chair, watching movies and listening to baseball games. Jason finds the silver lining in the simple things. For him, he doesn't focus on the fact he can no longer play sports. He finds pleasure in the ability to listen to the sporting event. He also focuses on simple routines. Heading to McDonald's for two hamburgers and a small fry is pure contentment for Jason. Frank reminds himself that he has value and a purpose to fulfill. He realizes that life is always evolving and that trying to hold on to what was only results in frustration and regret. Frank finds that living in the now provides satisfaction and happiness that he once had those experiences. Sherry notes that she's able to make meaning out of life by helping others whether it's helping someone in the ataxia community or sending an encouraging note to another person. Sherry makes meaning by using what she's learned and helping others. When Stephanie is having a tough moment, she recalls a memory she holds on to to keep herself going. Her nine-year-old son who has ataxia wanted to run a lap in class and finish on his own. His legs were getting tired, but he wanted to push through. His classmates saw him pushing through and came alongside him and finished the lap with him. Now, is that not a beautiful and precious story? When Stephanie is having a tough moment, she thinks of her son pushing through and she pushes through too. It was made clear to me throughout these interviews that each person had undergone a significant transformation since ataxia entered their lives. Each of them had, and still are at times, undergoing emotional pain and also discovering a strength they did not know was there. They have embraced the grief and emotional effects of ataxia and have allowed themselves to be, be made new by it. They all agree they were better able to move through the grief because they had wonderful partners and surrounded themselves with supportive people who encouraged and helped them. As we close today, there's one thing I want to leave with you, and that is hope. In the interviews, faith was shared as a very important thing for most in helping them thrive. My faith has an ancient writing that says, we are to grieve, but not without hope. 
it's true that at times we are going to feel pressure coming in from all sides, but we know we will not be crushed or abandoned. My hope for all of you is that you'll allow yourselves to grow through your grief, get to know yourselves more deeply, and discover your own, perhaps hidden, strengths and resilience. Thank you for the pleasure of sharing with you today. Thank you, Tamara. That was a fantastic presentation. A um, lot of kudos coming in through the chat on this topic. 103 of you joined us, so it's a topic that is of great interest to the Ataxia community. So just wanted to thank you for your time. Um, so everyone, if you want to submit any questions that you have for Tamara, we've got about 20 minutes for some Q&A. A couple have come in so far, but to submit your question, just go down to the Q&A tab at the bottom and send that through for us. Um, Tamara, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to share before I jump into any questions for you? I just really wanna thank Frank Orlovsky and uh, Jason and Sherry Hubbard and Stephanie Leonard for helping me, helping me with that presentation. I really appreciate you know, their sharing and their vulnerability, so. Great. All right, well, our first question that we have is, does ataxia make a person more emotional even before they have obvious symptoms or have been diagnosed? Right, I can't speak as specifically to ataxia. That's probably a wonderful question for your doctor. But in speaking with, you know, going through a chronic illness, it's probably going to cause trauma. And, uh, you know, I'm a trauma therapist, so I would say, you know, anytime we go through any type of trauma, whether it's, you know, a big T trauma or a little T trauma, we're definitely going to be emotional about that. Uh, we are emotional beings. And so, yes, we're going to be emotional when we go through things that are life changing and affect our lives and affect our loved ones. And so, uh, well, I would say, don't fight that, you know, embrace those emotions, having emotion and having an emotional reaction to something is never a bad thing. Uh, so experiencing depression, experiencing anxiety, experiencing sadness and grief or anger, um, that's never a bad thing. Those are, uh, you know, to say God given emotions, right? And what I would say is it's, it's not the emotion that's the negative thing. It's what we do with the emotion, right? Do we beat ourselves up about the emotion? Do we take it out on other people? Uh, do we try to stuff it down and pretend like it's not there? Those are the negative things. So having the emotion, having an emotional reaction to something, that's perfectly fine. But it's what we do with those, how we behave as a result of it that's where we need to pay attention to. Is this a healthy expression or an unhealthy expression? Great, thank you for that answer. Um, our next question is, what are the effects of ataxia on sexual desire? Again, I would definitely talk to your doctor about that. Uh, you know, I th again, I think that with any, um, anytime we go on a medicine and anytime we are experiencing a chronic illness, our sexual desires going to be affected. But again, I think, you know, that's not an area of expertise for me. And so I would, I would definitely speak, you know, with your, your medical doctor about that. Gotcha. Um, how do we cope and stay positive for the future? Yes, that's, <laughs> that's always hard, right? Um, coping and staying positive for the future. Um, I would again, pay attention to our thoughts. You know, what is that internal dialogue saying about our circumstances? You know, again, are we beating ourselves up? 
I think a key thing when we're experiencing grief or when we're experiencing negative situations is are we coming from an aspect that um, the world should be a fair and just place? Um, I think that a lot of times our world can tell us that if we are, um, if we work hard and we're moral people, then we should, we should have a breeze, right? It should be easy going. And um, that kind of deals with cause and effect thinking that if I just work hard and I make all the right decisions, that everything's going to be okay for me. And unfortunately, that sets us up for a lot of disappointment. And because the thing is, is that bad things do happen to really good people. And a lot of times we cannot make sense out of that when we do undergo really, um, you know, disease and when bad things happen. And so how we keep hope for the future is understanding that we did not cause this. We did not create this. This is not our fault. It's not our loved one's fault. We are not doing anything wrong because we are undergoing what we're going through right now. And so it's being able to separate out my circumstances from who I am, you know, that those are two completely different separate things. And so it's not, it's not, you know, attaching ourselves to our circumstances and it's, and it's figuring out when do I feel peace? Do I feel peace when I stay connected to my loved ones? Do I feel peace when I stay connected to my higher power? Do I feel peace when I, you know, am doing routines that give me, you know, pleasure? And so it's really removing that cause and effect thinking. Great. We have a couple questions that have come in on the same topic. Um, so one, my biggest problem is anger. How can I control anger? It's kind of just of a couple of those questions. Absolutely. That's always a great question. And again, it's remembering that anger itself is not a bad thing. It's just how we express it. I always use the example of anger is like a shield of armor. And so if you think of, you know, uh, back in medieval days when knights put on armor, right? It's metal, it's hard, and it protects the flesh. And that's exactly what anger's purpose is, is that when we are experiencing anger, the, that anger is going to be the first emotion that's going to arise. And it protects more, quote, fleshier emotions. So anger is probably protecting a more vulnerable emotion such as embarrassment or fear or sadness or hurt. There's something deeper down that's going on, but anger acts as this armor and it's kind of like, I don't want to experience this. I don't want to feel this. And so it kind of keeps people at an arm's length. And so I would encourage people who experience anger and notice that anger, frustration, irritability, any of those cousin emotions to anger, I would, I would encourage you to maybe dig a little deeper and try to figure out mm, what else is going on here. Because I, I would guarantee you that it's something deeper and it's more vulnerable of an emotion such as her embarrassment or fear. Stephanie, you're on mute. There we go. We've got a person whose um, spouse is the one that makes them feel like they have a disability. What can they say to that, their spouse? Great question. Um, you, you, um, you can definitely try to, um, to speak with that person and you know offer offer education um, that may work right uh, taking them to um, doctor's appointments with you get, getting that education that way but um, if that doesn't work because that may not work 
um, you may have a spouse that um, whose mind can't be changed, right? Um, sometimes that's just the the fact of the matter. Um, and um, I would encourage that person if if your spouse's mind can't be changed, your if your loved one's mind can't be changed, and that's the way that they're going to um, interact with you. I would encourage you as that person to understand and know. Um, to know your value and know your worth and to know that you, you know, you know, the truth, um, because sometimes we live with people who are going to treat us, um, inappropriately. And so, um, so yeah, I would first try education. If you've already done that, then you may need to, um, focus more on yourself and taking care of yourself in that matter. And, um, nurturing, nurturing yourself, surrounding yourself with people who don't treat you that way. Great. Thank you. How do we get ourselves unstuck from grief since ataxia brings so many changes? It, yes. Great question. Uh, yeah, there are constant changes and constant griefs that stack on top of each other with ataxia. There's constant losses and, um, Getting unstuck is a great question because um, as those as those griefs and as those losses continue continuously happen, I would suggest being able to acknowledge those. Uh, and if if you do find yourself that you are stuck and you you are feeling emotionally paralyzed, that may be the time to speak with a therapist. If you are finding that you're um, you're you're having days in which you feel as though it's getting harder to feel emotionally motivated, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling stuck, that may be when you need to go speak with a therapist, just someone who has who can listen, validate, give you different ideas, um, and give you a different perspective or give you different feedback. Or someone who you can just go share everything on your mind and you know it's not going to go anywhere. They're, you know, they are an objective third party. And, um, but if the, the stuck piece, that's a key word because if you do feel stuck, then that is when you may need to go speak with a therapist. Great. So we've got a couple questions that came in that are essentially the same. Um, is it important to see a therapist along this journey when you don't feel depressed? Great question. I think that if that thought is going through your mind, then explore that. Um, entering into therapy doesn't mean it's a lifetime um, commitment. Uh, a lot as a therapist, a lot of my clients may come for, you know, a few months and then they know they can come back and see me at any point in time. Uh, if they need what we call booster sessions and come back for one or two sessions and then, you know, it's an as needed basis. Uh, it, again, it can be if you want to go and speak with a therapist to just have someone listen uh, who knows all of that information because you know that this is heavy stuff. Grief is heavy stuff. Chronic illness is heavy. It's not always positive. And you know, you want to go to someone in, instead of your family members. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but again, I think that everyone's different. Some people have a huge support system and they have many people they can go talk to. But if you don't have a huge support system, then definitely seeking out counseling would be would be perfectly fine. Awesome. So this is a good question. Do you have suggestions for family members that seem to be emotionally affected by your ataxia? Um, and this person specifically um, is asking how you can how they can encourage them to see how they deal with it. And selfishly, they're thinking, "Suck it up. You don't. You're not the one that has ataxia." <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, it, it it did. Yeah, I think that we've we've got to avoid getting into the comparison game. 
uh, because everyone is affected differently. And uh, seeing a loved one going through uh, a disease uh, is hard. And uh, so, yes, family members definitely need to see to seek out counseling if they are struggling, right? It, it, they are struggling for some reason. It may be completely unknown. It may be very bewildering as to why are you struggling? I'm the one going through this, right? Uh, but it it may be hitting on an issue that is completely unknown and completely unrelated, but for some reason they're struggling. And so I would encourage them, yeah, definitely get some help. And, and to, yeah, I, I yeah, my answer is yes. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions that are similar. Um, is grief something that you must go through is one. And then another is what can you share about those of us who may have skipped the grief stage? Sure. Grief is a very, very healthy process. Um, it, I'm trained in a trauma therapy that remove, you know, is highly effective. But the one thing that this trauma therapy will not remove is grief, okay? Because it is such a healthy process for us to go through. And so what I would say to anyone, uh, I don't know if anyone skips a grief process, they may get, um, they may still be in denial that they're in a grief process. Uh, they may be stuck in anger um, in a grief process, but I don't know if anyone really skips it. They just may not realize that they're in it. Um, they may be, you know, denying and sweeping something under the rug. Um, and it may take, again, the grief process, we go back and forth through it. You know, as my dad passed away 24 years ago, um, I still, there are moments where it just gets me. And at the anniversary date of his death, you know, it's a hard day. It's a somber day. Um, and, but I still mainly live in the acceptance part, but there's days when I go back into that sadness and depression part. And so, um, we all, it's a very healthy stage because then what we learn and how we're transformed through that, we can turn to each other and say, hey, I know what you've been going through. Here, let me walk alongside with you and let me do this with you. Great. Um, we've got one person that says, what do we do if we feel like we're losing control? The doctors think I was born with this, so I feel like I've never really had any. I've never really what? Had any control. Sure. Um, I would get, uh, definitely um, get in a group of people, like get a good support group of uh, peers that um, also have ataxia so that you can get a good, being in a group of people that um, are going through similar things, always, always very helpful. Um, and then again, if you feel like you don't have any control, um, I would definitely seek out therapeutic help because that again could, figuring out the source of that would be very important. What should I do if family members don't believe that I can really not work and get a job? Mm. Again, educating them on that, having, you know, uh, having them come to doctor's appointments. And um, unfortunately, people um, will uh, minimize what chronic illness can do. And again, yeah, I would try to educate them but that would be more for the doctors to, to talk with them about if they're, if they're open to it. But as we know, we have family members that are not open. They're, they close their minds to those things. Um, and unfortunately, we have very little control or power over people, as I'm sure a lot of you have found out. And um, I would take take the perspective of if you've tried to explain to them and they haven't uh, opened their minds to it, I, I would take the focus, turn it onto yourself and figure out what do I have control over 
and, and more empower yourself of what's within my control. All right. We've got about three minutes left, so I'll maybe fit a couple more in here. Um, as a mother with a son who has ataxia, how do I address emotional issues he is experiencing from the past moving forward without hindering him? Right. I love open-ended questions with kids. You know, how are you feeling? Kids do great with colors. You know, what colors are your feelings? And always just open-ended questions. Uh, how does that feel? Uh, and letting them answer, uh, you know, or there's always feeling sheets that you can give that have funny faces on them uh, that kids can point to um, and just asking those open-ended questions. And then based on the answers that kids give, you can ask more questions about the language that they provide. You know, in even asking, like we talked about in the video, you know, where in your body do you feel that emotion and what do you want to do about it or have them draw you a picture. And so it's, it's being able to name those emotions with kids and, and allowing from the, from early on that emotions are fine. We all have emotion and being able to explore that with them. And, and then even asking kids, what do you need? Right. Um, do you, do you need a hug? Do you need space, right? What, what do you need because you're feeling this way and kids are smart, right? Kids are smart. They know what they need, or they may say, I don't know. And we can say, well, and we can name a few things because you're their parent, you know, you know how they are. And, um, but yeah, getting them in that routine of naming those emotions. Okay. And then what would be your advice? for adult children. So it's an adult child of yours that has ataxia. Um, what, what can you do to kind of help them? Yeah, again, I would ask them, how can I support you? How can I help you? Uh, you know, and allow that adult child to, to name that, you know, we are, we are experts on what we need. And so I know that it's hard as parents, we want to <laughs> jump in there and do it for them. But being able to say, I, you know, we can name how we're feeling. I feel scared. I'm, you know, I'm so concerned about you, but we need to allow that adult child to be able to tell us how we can support them and how, what, what it is that they're needing. And, um, and keep that dialogue open, you know, that it's okay as a parent to say, you know, I love you and I'm scared too, but what, what can I do for you? I want to be there for you. Thank you. And then we are at the hour. So I will ask one final question and then we hit most of the topics that were asked. Um, positive self-worth is a constant deflating balloon. How can we redefine our own self-worth with having ataxia? Right. It's a great question. It's like always the question, right? Positive self-worth. Um, I think that it would be look not, not looking at other people and not looking at our circumstances to define who we are. Um, those things are going to change. People are going to come in and out of our lives uh, and our circumstances are always going to change. And I think that it would be looking at, you know, for each person, how do we define, um, who we are? And, uh, it needs to be something constant. It needs to be right. Our jobs come and go, right. Our relationships with other people come and go, but what, what is our, how do we see ourselves, you know, and that's going to be about character, right. And it's going to be about um, our personality and it's going to be, and for those who, you know, as I mentioned in the video, uh, those who uh, have a strong faith, they, they know that their um, self-worth is defined on something higher, um, but it's making sure that it's not based on something that can, can change, right? It's got to be something constant. And so it's, it's got to be something that is 
is you know within and uh, and so more character and uh, and also permanent. So thank you. And you're getting lots of thanks for a great session comments in thank the chat. Um, so I just wanted to thank you again for your time. Thank you everyone that joined us. Uh, it's time for lunch break and we'll see everyone back around two. <laughs>